Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the breaker session. Uh, we start off this morning with uh, mobile security attacks uh, with Yair Amit and Adi Sharavani from SkyCure. Good morning. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you have fun in the conference so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what uh, Adi and I are going to do today is uh, do a pretty challenging job. We're going to try to use the next 45 minutes to provide you an overview about emerging and current threats on mobile devices. Uh, as a mobile security company, we perform a lot of research and uh, in, in, during the presentation we will also touch a few of uh, SkyCure originated SkyQ, uh, research. Uh, but before we start, uh, I'd like to give you a quick uh, overview about ourselves. Uh, personally, uh, I've been uh, uh, active in the security research world for about 15 years now, have more than 15 f uh, patents filed in the field of security, and my background actually spent a huge amount of time around web application security, both in watch Watchfire, in which we provided the AppScan product family, as well as later on, after we were required by IBM, uh, managing the worldwide application security group. So good morning everyone, I'm Adisha Rabani, I'm the CEO of SkyCure. I've uh, been doing and living security for the past 17 years. Uh, in my relevant background, I was a manager at uh, Watchfire where I built and managed the uh, application security and research group. Uh, after the acquisition by IBM, uh, I took different roles. The last one was responsible over the security of IBM software products. And I'm also very proud to be a high school teacher um, and very active in the uh, cyber security related uh, activities. Uh, a fellow at Yuvan Eman workshop, uh, which held a conference last week, a very interesting one. And that's it. Um, the agenda for today's session uh, will try to cover all four major threats for mobile devices. Uh, there is the physical layer, which is kind of um, handled by the operating systems and MDM, uh, mobile device management solutions. Uh, there is the network layer, which is a huge gap today, especially from the organizational perspective. Uh, there are the uh, discussed topic of malware, which is having a lot of changes over the past few years and would like to somehow uh, give you visibility to some of these uh, changes. And there is the notion of application security and privacy, and everyone here in the audience that uh, lived OWASP for many years saw the huge increase in application level threats on the web servers, and now we see that this increase starts to come to the uh, mobile applications themselves. Uh, what we're going to try to do is, on one hand, give you an holistic uh, understanding of the threats, but on the other hand, we want it to be very uh, tactical and to the point. So during the presentation, we're going to cover a lot of uh, examples of each of these cases to try to give you an overall story and better understanding of this, not in a very high level, 20,000 mile uh, kind of discussion. So what we actually decided to do is, uh, you know, we just discussed before the presentation and we, we said that in any presentation you have a very, very boring slide. So we decided to just start with it so the rest would be better, okay? Uh, so the, the slide is, is actually talking about the physical air and I believe that uh, anybody in this room is uh, very familiar with this kind of problems. Three years ago when many people talked about uh, mobile security, they actually talked about physical security. Obviously today, the, the big dangers are outside of this uh, vector. But just about scenarios in which your device is being lost or just stolen. And over the years, the operating systems and some mobile device management solutions have provided some mitigations for these uh, threats. By the way, mainly around device loss, not, not necessarily around a uh, device uh, being stolen. So I'm talking about the ability to remotely wipe the device and other capabilities. Uh, yeah, here is a note about lost and stolen device and the difference in this. I see still many people that are talking about this as a similar concept. You know, when your device gets stolen, the first thing that the stealer does is to remove the internet connectivity uh, from that device, uh, disallowing all of the, uh, many of the uh, mitigations uh, to happen. Um, okay, so let's move on to some more interesting things. Uh, you know, we have the uh, uh, mobile devices connecting to networks all the time. How many of you, just to know, how many of you have iOS devices? How many of you have Android devices? Yeah, cool. approximately 70% iOS, 30% Android, something like that. Um, and I'm, I assume that you all connect to wireless networks all the time. How many of you connected to the Wi-Fi of the hotel or uh, the conference? 
So we do that all the time, right? And in many cases, we don't have visibility to the type of threats that happen there. So shortly, I'm going to show some of the threats that we see and how they evolved with time. But before that, let's talk a little bit about statistics. So the first thing we notice is that 10% of all the networks that we connect to contained at one point of time a threat. And I'm, by talking about a threat, I'm not talking about, hey, this is a public network, so someone can see what I'm doing, and et cetera. I'm talking about an active attempt to change your traffic and to perform something like decrypt your SSL uh, information, uh, to perform SSL stripping attack, and et cetera. Um, this can be uh, originated by the owner of the network, but also from malicious uh, people that connect to the same network as you connect to. And sometimes we see cases where a naive person that only has a virus on their device connect to that network, and through that device, the remote attacker is attacking the local nearby uh, uh, people that connect to this network. From the perspective of the device, the end user, we see that there is 23% likelihood that you will connect to such a network within a period of one month. When we take a larger period of time, obviously the likelihood of you to connect to such a network increases with time. And we also see some differences with behaviors of people. So if you tend to travel more, you're more susceptible to such uh, attacks. Um, we just recently uh, published an open uh, project that you can just browse to maps.skyq.com and search for any location that you want and gain information about uh, incidents that happened in uh, that area. Uh, this will give you up to 10 uh, incidents per search. Uh, and that would allow you to answer questions like, the, is there any attack taking place near your home, near your office? Uh, are there any specific uh, networks you should be uh, concerned about? Uh, get alerts, and etc. And that's, that's an interesting notion, because we've been talking for years now about the obvious uh, fact or belief that in areas such as airports, there are more attacks being carried against uh, Wi-Fi users, right? For obvious reasons. We are, in many cases, businessmen that need connectivity. We are very tired. We don't have a good roaming plan. And therefore, we connect to Wi-Fi networks. And attackers know that and utilize that. But the exciting point is that using this uh, tool, free tool, that contains more than 100 thousand incidents, you can actually see for a fact that around airports, such as JFK, you see much more incidents and exposures. And that's, a, in my perspective, a very interesting visibility about the current status today. So let's talk about what are the threats that we see. And over here, we divide them into two types of threats. Implementation issues, uh, which are essentially bugs that someone created uh, somewhere, and design issues, which are problems in the design of how things are working. Usually, the implementation issues are being fixed as they've been uh, discovered. And the design issues are, takes much, much longer to fix because it's a, a change of what we are doing and how we are doing it. Uh, so when we talk about implementation issues, uh, we want to, you know, because these are bugs, we want to talk about the developers of this operating system. So over here we see a difference between iOS and Android, right? Uh, in iOS, we have a very good uh, update mechanism. So whenever uh, groups like us uh, report an incident to Apple, uh, we don't talk about it. Apple fixes the issue, and as soon as they fix the issue, the update gets pushed to uh, a very good rate of users. Uh, you remember the statistics? Yeah, actually, or? today it's uh, more than 92% of devices already run iOS 7, the latest version, except let's not think about uh, the, the fresh iOS 8. But like a few days ago, when you would look at the, at the status, you would see about 93% using iOS 7 and about 6% using iOS 6. That means a very good uh, conversion rate. And that's uh, good in particular when you think about Android, where there is a, the huge challenge of fragmentation. A lot of users, a lot of market share, but at the end of the day, each device, if you, each user is restricted to a certain level of operating system. And when incidents such as security incidents happen, and even when a patch is released, the time that it takes from the incident until you are actually protected might be very, very, very long. That's a big problem. So let's look at uh, two types of threats. Uh, we'll should demonstrate one that uh, was recently re revealed in iOS and another one that was revealed in, in Android. 
Yeah, so uh, very, very nice uh, uh, bugs in my perspective. The first one is uh, well-known go to fail, was actually uh, uncovered in February this year. And that's an amazing bug, bo both of because of the reasons, the technical aspects of this bug, but also about uh, its ramifications. So first of all, we're talking about a bug that existed for all of, our, or for all of us, all of the iOS users, for 17 months without being patched or uh, known to the public. And the ramifications of this go-to-fail bug were actually the ability of an attacker to be in the same area as you are, in the same network as you are, and being able to seamlessly listen and manipulate not only plain text communication, but also SSL communication. So I'm talking about your exchange, about your bank, about your Facebook, about your LinkedIn, whatever. And we actually chose to show you a quick snippet from the actual bug called the go to fail. And that's actually an, a funny bug because it's, it's, base, it's basis for us developers is, is rather common. It happens to us, but not in this level of critical path. Uh, this is called uh, copy and double paste, okay? So let's look at a function uh, in iOS that was responsible for part of the SSL handshake uh, logic. And this function is actually responsible to check uh, part of the stages and validate that they are valid. And at the end of the result, if the function returns zero, everything is okay. Otherwise, it, it just uh, uh, explains what is the problem in the validation. Um, the, sec the second element that is important is this function that actually does the actual verification. And this is where we actually, as developers, want each of, of uh, the handshake to be validated. But as many of you may uh, know, this is the bug. We have go to fail twice. And what it actually means, jump to the end of the, of the code. And the interesting part is that if this function just returns zero, that means nothing bad happens in this specific stage, the function would return zero, which, which indicates that the whole logic was executed and the, and the certificate is valid. You know, we always talk about coding conventions. And yeah. I always like to, when I used to code, I always like to put brackets in, even if that has only one line. And this is a great example for why it's important. Uh, the, indentation, the indentation might uh, cause you to think that uh, both of them are inside the if, but because no brackets exist here, then the second uh, go to fail will always be called, or the first one, yeah, as you said. Yeah, uh, so another example, uh, Heartbleed, I'm not going to talk about it a lot. Uh, I think it was discussed in any conference, in security conference since uh, April this year. Uh, in a nutshell, it allows, um, many of the discussion was around the ability to extract 64 kilobytes of information from web servers, and as we all know, the exposure was just terrible. But the interesting notion is that uh, mobile can also be exposed. And a few uh, researchers has actually showed that for uh, Android 4.1.1, which enabled the, the vulnerable uh, OpenSSL library, and also the uh, Heartbeat extension, were actually vulnerable to that. Uh, harder exploitation, but still possible. And at the time of the exposure, the uncovering, we had 50 million devices running this version of Android. And that's a huge problem. So we talked about implementation bugs. Let's talk about design issues. And over here, uh, we really like design issues because they stay. You know, they are going to be with us for years from now. And we'll show some examples for that. We can divide them also to two sections. One are designs of the protocols themselves, how HTTP works, how HTTPS works, and etc. And other is design of the operating systems themselves. Um, and we see that mobile devices are much more uh, uh, challenged with these type of issues. Uh, first of all, especially when we're talking about uh, trying to protect these devices, we see that all the classical paradigms of uh, security approaches that have been used in the wild for the past 20 years on desktops are not really applicable uh, for the mobile.
allowing us to see what you are doing on this specific site. Just bear in mind, you know, it's, it's five years old and still applicable to many devices. Uh, so we've seen uh, standards such as HSTS that mitigate the risk, of, the risk of that, but still it's amazing to see five years later how so many devices are s still susceptible to this kind of problems, including mobile devices. Uh, we will share the slides later, so uh, wherever there are more questions on technical details, in many places we place to read more to external articles so they can provide that. Uh, for those of you who have iOS, how many of you seen this screen? And what would you say that, not you, but your friends would <laughs> do on this screen? <laughs> they would click continue, right? Any uh, suggestions about statistics? How many of, of the people click continue in your perspective? Shoot, because, uh, shout, because I can't 70%, hear. 95. 90, 92%. We did uh, several tests for that. We popped up this message uh, to a lot of users that have just passed by. And we saw that 92% of the users have clicked continue on the screen. Yair also made a great recommendation where uh, we didn't test that, by the way, but he thought of the 8% that didn't click continue. If we would pop up this message for them again, and again and again, they will probably click continue, right? So again, we didn't do this uh, analysis, but we are pretty positive that it will even increase uh, the numbers. The impact of this is very, very simple. This screen actually says to me, hey, uh, um, you're trying to interact with Google.com in an encrypted manner. In many cases, this is launched by your exchange mail application. And while the mail application wants to work in an encrypted manner, it is that someone is doing something fishy to the traffic. They are decrypting the traffic and re-encrypting it with their own keys. And it alerts you about it. And the, minute, the second you click continue, your email password is immediately leaked out to the uh, person that performed the attack. Uh, they have now control over your entire exchange traffic, which means in many organizations, access to you know, uh, the entire, it's the domain password, right? So all services uh, created by the organization. And it also allows the attacker to control other uh, services that you don't even use from the mobile devices, even services that doesn't need the same password. You know, when you forget your password for Salesforce, you click, I forgot my password and it sends you a verification, uh, a reset link to the email. So taking control over your email takes control over your entire digital life. Uh, last example that we have seen is someone that changed the contacts. Exchange is capable of changing some uh, elements on your device. So it can change your contacts and see your meeting information and etc. So one of the cases we saw is that someone caused uh, Yair's uh, number on your device, not to direct to actual Yair's number, but rather to a proxy number that tunnels all the, the calls to Yair, allowing them to tap into your calls. And I think that the human factor is in just an amazing problem, right? So, I mean, in this case, the operating system behaves okay. It identifies the problem, the invalid certificate, but still people fall for that. When I still remember when we presented in RSA USA, I met a, a very security-oriented colleague of mine, and while we were entering to the venue, I saw him looking at this dialogue and just continue, clicking on continue, because like most of us, he wanted to walk and live and we don't always take the right security uh, decision. And as you have seen in this case, the ramifications are pretty big. Uh, last example, uh, even older, the karma kind of attacks, they keep on coming in various constellations. Uh, the notion is that many devices, while they, they utilize uh, auto-connect capabilities, sometimes for hidden networks and sometimes for any network, they just broadcast the name of the networks they're used to connect to. And there are many tools, including uh, the widely purchasable uh, uh, Pineapple, that, that implement this kind of attacks. And the attack is very simple. Listen to broadcast names of SSIDs, and then just say, hi, that's me. Connect to me. And by doing so, you can actually get a lot of devices to automatically connect to your bad network, and then apply a variety of network-based attacks on these devices. So we're still in the network-related field, and we're talking about mobile-specific design issues. So for this, we need to better understand the uh, security mechanisms that were invented. So let's discuss uh, iOS as an example. 
So iOS is considered to be a relatively secure platform. Many people think that if you're using iOS, you're not susceptible to attacks, right? And there are many good reasons for that. You know, Apple has one store. All the applications are going through this store. Uh, there is heavy screening process uh, that they are doing on various aspects as well as malware and things like that. And uh, the sandboxing is pretty restricted, uh, so you're not really allowed to do a lot of things uh, through that channel. But we realized is that there are other vectors to access uh, the device. And one of those vectors is configuration profiles. Um, and configuration profiles are essentially XML files that anyone can create. Uh, and you can send them to any iOS device through email, SMS, website, uh, an app, and etc. And those will configure elements on your device. Uh, many groups are using them. Uh, IT are using them. MDM owners are using them. Sometimes apps are using them um, for legitimate reasons. And there are several interesting elements when comparing the profiles and the apps. First of all, there is no store. Uh, so Apple doesn't do any screening on them. They don't have any visibility to all the profiles that are going on uh, in the wild. And profiles, their effect is over the entire device. It's not bound to a specific app. So uh, as I expressed, we see a lot of uh, uh, relevant good usages of this. But we also, about two years ago almost, we identified uh, that this could be used for malicious purposes. And what we realized is that a malicious person can do a lot of things. One of them would be to install a proxy or VPN that will tunnel all, your all of your traffic from now on to a remote server, as well as install root certificate, causing you to, allowing them to decrypt your encrypted traffic. And we created a good demonstration for that. So this is what we're going to do now. Uh, for those of you who want to participate to get under attack, we will do it slowly. So we will not share anything without your permission uh, on screen, and each time ask for your permission. Uh, and you can opt in to be uh, attacked. Um, Just to clarify, we are going to remove this demonstration from your devices three minutes from now. Uh, so for those of you that want to participate, please open your Safari. Um, Close everything you did last night in Safari beforehand, please. Uh, and connect to uh, attack.skycure.com. Uh, you will see a screen over there or, of uh, free video streaming. All you need to do is download this profile. Sometimes we see complimentary Wi-Fi access. All you need to do is download this app or profile, and etc. So, um, issues. So Yair will also uh, attack himself. And this can try to reshare uh, the network. Yeah, just one second. No, uh, it should be Thunderbolt. It's okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Just one second. Uh, anyone is trying to connect, by the way, during this time? We were uh, farting you too much, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did this uh, in RSA, uh, the last RSA, and we were amazed by the fact that most of the audience uh, connected, and then we thought that we need to elaborate a bit more on uh, the impact, so now I see that maybe we did it too much. Um, so yeah, can you share your... Uh, uh, no, it uh, does not connect to the network. Just one second. Let's try it. Yeah. Just a moment. Okay. okay. Uh, so over here, this is the attacker screen, and here you can see uh, your screen. And what you will do is uh, he will open his Safari uh, and browse to this uh, malicious website and install this malicious profile. So I'm a layman. I see that uh, someone promises me uh, free movies, and I have a very secure iOS device. So I say, heck it, let's do it. I recognize this dialog because I installed the mobile device management in the, in the past, or maybe work with the mobile carriers that requires that. And I see that this uh, profile is legit. It looks like verified, green. OK, let's do it. I install the profile. You see, after about two seconds, I, I'm back in my, uh, in my browser. Just a second, we can see your screen. Can you try to share again, maybe? Sure, I'll try. We have some network issues. Okay. 
So as you will try to reconnect the screen to me, uh, I can see every action uh, that he's doing. He's currently on YouTube. This is the free video streaming uh, in practice. Uh, but yeah, you can search for some things uh, in Google. Uh, as Yair types, all of his keystrokes are get tunneled to the attacker uh, machine. Um, we actually leverage different uh, ways in order to install a key uh, logger here. Uh, we can actually control his device. So for example, he search for a low OWASP, OWASP, I can instead of that send a command to type uh, goodbye OWASP. And I'm taking control over Yair's keyboard and initiating the keystrokes from his device. So what actually happens is that I'm leveraging his credentials on the site. Whether it's a secure site or not, it doesn't matter. Um, this uh, allows attackers to uh, leverage situations where the device gain access to some specific uh, privileges. Two-factor authentication, biometrics, all of these kind of things cannot really help uh, against these things. Uh, obviously, I can direct him to any uh, uh, website I want, but it's uh, much more than this because over here I'm showing you the impact on the browser, which is very crucial because a lot of activity goes on on the browser, but it's not enough, right? So the impact is also uh, relates to any other app on the device. Uh, may I open? Maybe uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to send a command to Yair's device to open the LinkedIn app. And you will see that the LinkedIn app gets opened on his device. It, it, he isn't touching his device at all. LinkedIn works in an accredited manner, so all the traffic gets, but it gets routed to our servers, but we have the root certificate. So we can decrypt this traffic. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to connect to LinkedIn on yeah, here's behalf. And here I'm, uh, I'm here. It's not really fair because this is actually a year's laptop. Uh, we cleared the cache beforehand, uh, but you get the, the point. Uh, if you want to be more uh, excited about uh, uh, this kind of problem here, if you can open your mail. Yeah, actually, uh, I want to do and try something very fresh. First time we're trying it. So it might not work, but let's do it, OK? You're surprising the, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many of you use Wells Fargo? Okay. They are raising their hands slow. Yeah, 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 I know. Uh, go, go so, yeah, okay, so two things just happened, okay? First of all, Adi, uh, you can click on the blue, not the green one. <laughs> and uh, what we want you to, to do is actually... This, you didn't type your real... Uh, no, it's not my real password. But what you just saw is that I'm using the native, up-to-date version of Wells Fargo, typing my credentials, and yet, the attacker, the remote attacker, by the way, it doesn't have to be by me. It can be on the other, hand, the other side of the ocean. It can easily see what I just typed, my credentials to the bank. In, a, in addition, in parallel, without me doing anything, my mail app, my native mail app, connected in the background to my exchange successfully. But during that time, the man in the middle, the attacker of the malicious profile attack, was able to actually see my username and full Password. Can I click on the green one? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so please remove the attack. Sure. Uh, just to clarify, this is not a Wells Fargo disclosure. Yo. Uh, you know, m all the, uh, the apps that you can find, almost all the apps that you can find in the App Store are uh, vulnerable to this because essentially we're doing a very, very simple thing. Directing all of your traffic to us and due to the root certificate, we are decrypting all of your encrypted traffic. And this is what we like about these kind of problems of the design. Um, Please receive the cell. So where do we find these malicious uh, profiles? So first of all, there are these uh, service providers that provide you with some kind of service, free video streaming, but there are also more uh, services that actually provide some sort of service, but during this time, they are decrypting all of your uh, traffic. Uh, we see cases where we have uh, complementary Wi-Fi access, as I mentioned before. Uh, we see cases where there are vulnerable services. So uh, the case where uh, a service got you to install a, uh, a profile for their own reasons, and due to the vulnerability in it, uh, someone else managed to leverage this uh, trust that you have with the service and tunnel all of the traffic through them uh, instead. Uh, and we also see cases where there are privacy violating services. Uh, a couple of months ago, LinkedIn uh, had profiles in their app causing all of your traffic, and they actually did it. They decrypted all of your email traffic for various features that are, I really like those features, but they really, really hurt your privacy because they decrypt all of your uh, sensitive data. 
So, so we have uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, left and a lot of content to provide, so we will try to focus uh, on some interesting aspects that we want to share. Uh, first of all, uh, I think something very straightforward is the notion that malicious profiles, which just was uh, dem demonstrated as a very simple flow of an attack, can easily be utilized into becoming a viral process. And the notion is that once I hack and penetrate and impersonate your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your mail, I can easily utilize the same mechanism to utilize the, the relations of trust between you and your colleagues to make these profiles propagate very effectively. Okay, uh, another example uh, is Wi-Fi gate. Uh, the problem is, um, you know, we sometimes hear people that say that I never connect to Wi-Fi, so I'm, I'm, I'm safe, right? Uh, and then we can have the discussion of whether I can guess their, the Wi-Fi in their home, whether they're susceptible to problems like karma uh, and etc. But if you took an out-of-the-box iPhone, and just place your SIM card in it and never connect it to Wi-Fi. Are you really safe against Wi-Fi related threats? And this is what we found out, that not. Uh, in practice, what happens is that the carriers have the ability to specify Wi-Fi settings on your device. In practice, in many cases, they are even pre-bundled with the iOS device. So because of these settings are the exact settings for all uh, audience, I can look at them. And what we saw is that these settings also contain Wi-Fi uh, uh, credentials. Uh, carriers want to do, sometimes they want to offload their traffic, they want to gain access, to give you access where places they don't have cell tower coverage. And for that reason, they also specify Wi-Fi settings for you. If I create uh, a network in that name, your devices will automatically connect to my uh, router, allowing me to perform all the attacks that we have listed before, without even touching the device. And now this is uh, like, uh, this is in many ways uh, the future, up-level vulnerabilities. Uh, we've been discussing this for many years around web, and for the exact same reasons where uh, so many problems have evolved and made us uh, a lot of work and money over the past decade, we, we expect that these kind of problems to happen in mobile applications as well. We have millions of applications already available, and while the operating systems do become safer, mistakes, coding pitfalls of developers, I believe, will keep on happening. We can mitigate them, but we cannot completely eradicate them. Um, what we chose to do today is just choose a few examples of uh, application coding pitfalls. We actually have a lot of other examples, uh, but Let's uh, use the time to share a few of them. Uh, great. So first of all, we still see this. Anyone don't understand what this slide is talking about? If you don't, don't come next year. Um, it's still happening. I don't know why. It's still happening Like for major, major apps. Um, and it's like you know when we approach uh, vendors that create uh, or companies that create apps with these kind of threats, and we notify them, it's it, we are feeling even uncomfortable telling them uh, what's what's the problem here. So I hope that uh, it's okay that I'm not discussing this even. Uh, and a more interesting element is certificate pinning. Uh, essentially. Um, you know, SSL uh, was invented with a mechanism of signatures, right? So we have the root certificates, and they sign all the uh, certificates that are being used when we interact with an SSL-enabled website. And by that, we can identify the fact that we are actually talking to that uh, specific uh, service. However, if someone got, in a various way, uh, if someone got you to install a certificate on your device, or for some reason, uh, you know, you get this pop-up and you click continue, all, all these things, then everything fails. But in the, in the mobile world, we have a better solution for this. In the mobile world, your app can uh, verify that the chain of certificates that you get from the target server is exactly the chain of certificate that you were supposed to get, because you wrote both the app and the service. You know of both of them. And this is very different than the browser uh, case in the classical desktop environment where the owner of the browser has no control over the websites that you develop, that, that you connect oh. to, I'm sorry. And for this reason, the whole notion of a root certificate authority was created. 
Over here, we have something that is much, much better. And this will allow you to remove many of the attacks that we see on SSL on website, on, uh, on mobile applications. Another element here is that the users can never know. They always have to trust you. They no, don't know if you're connecting through HTTP, and they don't know if you're connecting through HTTPS or not doing the certificates. And hence, it's very important for you as developers to take responsibility uh, over this. Yeah, so uh, for obvious reasons, uh, this is not happening fast enough. And this is by the reason I, I did mention that Wells Fargo is not specifically vulnerable, and is correct. Almost all the applications in Apple's App Store do not perform certificate pinning. That is why Facebook is problematic. That is why LinkedIn, that's why Exchange and banks. And there are some uh, awareness issues, but also technical issues. Uh, when you perform certificate pinning, you are actually required to make things extra correct. Think about the notion of, of pinning a specific certificate that you currently have between the client that you wrote and the server that you wrote. What happens if the certificate now needs to be changed? Like if it's expired or just compromised? That means that if you haven't thought about this before, you would have a very big problem with your uh, applications because they expect specific certificate and want to change it. So in order to properly implement certificate pinning, you must also have uh, a mechanism that allows you to fall back and exchange the pinned certificate. There are some mitigations by the fact that we do have the ability to send a new version of apps through the app stores. But still, this is a, a very important notion, and I can share that we are aware to pretty big companies that had uh, a nightmare around that. Last example is something uh, I think is, is uh, a pretty nice, very, very simple, very logical problem uh, that still applies to tens of thousands of apps in the app store. Many fix it, but still, a year after we uncovered this, we see a lot of vendors still working on fixing that. And the problem is very, very simple. We're talking about apps and the way apps cache uh, HTTP direct directives. So let's see a quick uh, diagram and illustration of the, of the problem, and then we can discuss about its uh, ramifications. So we have an app. We are users. We connect to a Wi-Fi network in a scenario of a man in the middle. Okay? We use the app, but when the app starts sending requests, what the attacker has to do is very, very, very simple. He has to provide a 301 response redirecting to another URL. And 301 means persistent redirection, right? Uh, but what actually happens the moment that happens is that uh, the, the app now asks for the new URL that he received. And that one uh, actually gets to the attacker server, which in change want to make sure that the attack remains seamless. And for that reason, he actually requests the actually content from the real server. So, so far, what just happened is a very, very simple HTTP re uh, response attack with no visual indication to the victim. Why? The same UI is presented, and in mobile apps, unlike web browsers, you can't really see the URL, right? You don't have an idea where your app is communicated to. But the interesting part is if you think about the code that was written, you have like uh, in the first uh, request a specific URL for loading the information from your uh, app provider. But now what just happened is that the app logic has persistently changed. From now on, no matter what you do, you can close the app, open it, close the app, open it. It will keep on asking the requests instead of the real server. It will ask them from the fake server, from the attacker server. That becomes interesting like one month later. You are at your home, feeling secure, reading your news in New York Times or whatever. But, and I'm not saying this is vulnerable, just as an example. Uh, and you read the news, but now, instead of reading the real news, you are actually reading fake news. If it's a bank application, you understand the notion. And that's, that's for me, uh, a good example of, of the problem of application security. When someone identifies a problem in the operating systems, that is terrible. But the moment a patch is available, the exposure goes down pretty fast. In application security, where you have a category of problems, think about cross-site scriptings, think about SQL injection, it just keeps on happening for a long period of time till being properly mitigated. So we need to uh, uh, speed up. Um, let's talk uh, for a few minutes about uh, mobile. 
And when try to look at the future, I always try to look at the past and see what happened in the past and try to deduct uh, uh, according to that. So 2011 uh, was marked to be the year of Android malware. We've seen tons of Android malware on the Google Play, external stores, and et cetera. And in 2012, Google decided to fight that with features such as Bouncer that started to do scanning, similar to what uh, iOS uh, is doing. And they've been improving that ever since. Uh, in 2013, we hardly see any malware on the Google Play. All the reports that you will see are usually trying to uh, confuse you around this. But in practice, 99% of the malware is from external stores. Recently, Google decided to fight that as well. So they've introduced features such as Verify Apps, which purpose is to identify and uh, uh, handle situations where malware apps are getting from external uh, stores. In that sense, Google is becoming more and more like iOS uh, on the front. But the malware problem will not, uh, the malware problem will not be you know, uh, fully mitigated, right? We know that it's here to stay. And what we see is that there is kind of an axis between uh, real malware apps that we can think about and apps that hurts your privacy. And they actually provide some kind of service. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in Google, uh, in Android, uh, when a new app installs itself, it asks for various credentials. And let's assume that it asks for credentials to see all of your keystrokes. It's a keyboard. Now in iOS 8, you can do that as well. Now, if I would tell you that I'm taking all of your keystrokes and sending them to a remote server, would you say I'm a malware? Yes, right? But if I would say that I'm a very sophisticated keyboard that is capable of giving you recommendation based on the things that your friends has typed in the past in their uh, uh, devices, then I'm suddenly a service. And it doesn't matter because you are still at risk. And if I'm talking about organizations which uh, puts so much money in protecting their uh, devices of their employees, they are simply unaware of these kind of uh, problems. Let's, let's skip yeah, uh, for I the sake of time. Uh, I want to summarize. Uh, we talked about uh, four main threats. Uh, the first one is the physical error. The, the second one is the network-based threats. And the third one is the malware and application security threats. And we see them uh, as becoming a unified uh, problem. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the discussion. We hope you enjoyed the demo. Uh, if you want to see it uh, on your own devices, we would love to do it uh, for you. Uh, and that's it. If there are any questions, we would like to answer them. Thanks. Yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question was, has Apple addressed anything about signing the profiles? So there is a way, a mechanism, to sign profiles. This mechanism does not go through Apple. So there are actually two mechanisms, but uh, one of them doesn't go through Apple. Uh, and even the one that goes through Apple is not really a blocker for attackers uh, because Apple gives you a certificate to sign your profile with your uh, uh, Apple's certificate, but they don't see what's going on with these profiles later on. And we need to remember that there are many legitimate uses of profiles where the owner that created the profile doesn't really want to go through Apple. The simplest example is SSL decryption that is done by the organization. Some organizations are doing that, right? SSL inspection. SSL inspection. So they decrypt your traffic. They want to install certificate on your device. This is essentially a, you know, a semi-profile that they install on the mobile devices. It doesn't have anything to do with Apple. But just to clarify, any of the uh, discussion and, and examples that we provided is obviously fully synced with Google and Apple. The, in some extent, the beauty of these problems as security researchers is the fact that, that they are very hard to solve. For example, in 7.1, iOS 7.1, we actually uh, found a way to uh, create invisible, completely invisible profiles, both for the user and MDMs. But this wasn't an implementation problem. And for that reason, together with Apple, uh, iOS 7.1 patched this vulnerability. But the more logical problem of configuration profile is something that is logically hard to solve. Any more questions? Yes.
Yeah, so this is, this is an attack, and as an attack, it can be used for malicious purposes. The whole uh, reason we created this demonstration is to demonstrate in a very unique and appealing way the problem. Uh, by disclosing the code, we are pretty obvious that it will be used by malicious groups, yeah. and this is definitely not something that we want to do. We are focused on providing, like, in creating solutions that protect against attacks, not attacking it in any way. Yes. Didn't hear, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? What are your thoughts on using public key tuning instead of uh, certificate? Um, so you mean to... Uh, uh, so the idea is not to make sure that the entire chain of certificate is the same, but just the top one? So the question was, when we discussed certificate pinning, uh, we discussed the fact that we want to verify that uh, the entire change of certificate as you expected to get was the one that you got uh, in your app. Uh, and yeah. the question was whether it's enough just to sign the top, uh, uh, the, the root certificate that is used. This is, uh, uh, I believe it's not enough. And the reason is that we sometimes see cases where uh, someone steals the root certificate, the private key of it, uh, and we saw cases of that uh, in the past few years, uh, and then they will be able to perform uh, their attacks. Uh, but yeah. the, the, the value of this is that if you change your certificate, you don't need to update the apps. So, so the, the answer is it's a scale. We're actually going to release a blog post discussing all of the ways to implement this, and that's a scale of security and flexibility. And this is certainly one of the options that we offer. So it's, it's viable in my perspective, less secure, but much more flexible. Uh, it's uh, going back to the question of security. There is no secure, right? There is levels that you need to decide based on what your organization needs are. I think there are, uh, we need to wrap up. Yeah. So we are here, so you can approach us and uh, we'd love to answer questions. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Gayer, yeah, Adi, thank you. You guys will be available for the rest of the session? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. great. And I also want to point out, by the way, that all speakers have a green badge. So if you see a green badge,